Hello and welcome to the Higher Aim of Art. On Wednesday, June 5th, 2019, Studio and Kamenani welcomed Dr. Linton Whitaker to lecture on the human face in plastic surgery, art, and beyond. A sixth generation Texan and a graduate of the University of Texas, Dr. Whitaker then went on to graduate from Tulane School of Medicine. He interred at the Montreal General Hospital, served two years in the U.S. Army, did a general surgery residency at Dartmouth, and a plastic surgery residency at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, where he has been since 1969. There he served as chief of plastic surgery at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. At the Children's Hospital, he held the first two chairs in plastic surgery. He is now surgeon emeritus at Children's Hospital and honorary surgeon at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He remains as professor of plastic surgery at Penn in 1972, Dr. Whitaker founded the Cranial Facial Program at Penn and served as its director until 2000. In 1987, Dr. Whitaker established the University of Pennsylvania Center for Human Appearance and remains as its director. This was the first multidisciplinary center dedicated to research, education, and the treatment of appearance-related disorders at a major medical center in the United States. Treatment programs in Eastern Europe, Mexico, and Africa have been partially funded by the center. Dr. Whitaker holds 11 honorary memberships in medicine and medical societies, including eight in foreign countries. Honors include, among others, special honors and the Distinguished Service Award from the American Society of Maxillofacial Surgeons and the Tessier Medal from the International Society of Craniofacial Surgery. In 30 years, the Tessier Medal was awarded only once before. Three Whitaker lectureships have been established in his name. He has been listed in Castle and Connolly's Best Doctors in America every year since it was published in 1979, in Who's Who in America since 1996, and in Who's Who in the World since 2004. His academic activities included having co-authored or authored 227 papers, six books on plastic surgery, and having given more than 300 invited lectures to scientific organizations worldwide. As chief and program director at Penn, he had primary responsibility for training 45 plastic surgery residents and 30 craniofacial fellows. It's kind of bright in there. <laughs> <laughs> so Nelson would have said, Nelson, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, we've been friends for, or were friends for 45 years, and Nelson, who I introduced on multiple occasions, interacting in our world of plastic surgery with art, would have said, don't say all that nonsense. Let me get up there and show people what, what painting is all about. So I guess that's right. At any rate, next slide. <coughs> I've known Nel uh, Nelson, I'm still speaking as though he is alive, and uh, he is to me in many ways. Uh, we've been uh, best of friends since 1973 when he did a sketch of my Renata, my wife, uh, at Springdale, which was uh, where he was living at that time, um, up the Delaware River, in uh, a very interesting place. And this was at that time. Next. And uh, as payment for something I did for him and his family, uh, he, he uh, said, I don't have any money, so can I give you a painting uh, instead of money for what, you're, what you've done? And uh, that happened. You see in the lower left that he's doing that painting of Renata. I never understood how he was so bald, but, uh, but <laughs> combed over so it always looked like he wasn't. And it didn't look like a comb, comb over. So next. And we got to be really good friends. We traveled in Europe together. Uh, he painted uh, the ambassador to Russia and traveled there with him. And also the ambassador's wife um, in uh, Paris. And we were together with that. At any rate, that's our Irish wolfhound. And uh, Rufus uh, and Nelson liked each other. Next. And our son, Derek, who uh, had a major medical illness, and um, Nelson, as a friend, 
uh, wanted to do a painting of Derek, and he did this in 1977 when Derek was 11 years old. Next. And he was uh, living in London at John Singer Sargent's uh, apartment and studio, and was uh, and did paint uh, Margaret Thatcher and Princess Diana, and I came, my Renata and I came through on our way to Switzerland, and uh, he said, uh, let me do a painting while you're here, and he did that painting, my hands look a little more bony and a little more vascular now than uh, they did in 1978. Next. And uh, this was the year he moved to Chelwood, and um, this is just a painting of him working in his studio there. And again, we were together probably 25 or 30 weekends a year during those years. Next. And as a gift to me, and as a gift to us because of the illness of our son, he did this painting. L-A-W is I. Next. That's you. And because I was doing some unusual surgery, getting a lot of national and international attention, craniofacial surgery, he asked to come and watch me do that. And uh, here is the operating room at Children's Hospital, and Nelson did this sketch um, in 1979. Next. And this is what it looked like sometime. <laughs> And he, back then, he usually had that cancer stick in his hand a lot. Next. And when I was president of the International Society of Craniofacial Surgery um, in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, I chose him to be the keynote speaker because he and I had developed this thing about what I do and what he does and talked a lot about the similarities and the differences in the two fields. And this is in Santa Fe after he gave a wonderful 30 minute talk. Uh, this is the program and the book that was subsequent to that. Next. And then he did my official portrait for Children's Hospital. You see the two of us at the presentation of my portrait and in that portrait as he does. I, I, I did quite a lot. This is a book written about me, a book written by me, and I was doing unusual things with infants and their deformities. That's Renata. That's from the um, my office. You don't see very much. Next. And this is the next to last slide. He knew our daughter from the age, from the time she was uh, Let's see, she was born in uh, 1969, so she, he knew her from about when she was three or four years old. And, and here she is all those years since 1969, and he wanted to do a sketch of her. So that's our daughter, Ingrid. Thanks. And that's the last time we were together uh, in this place. And uh, we had an evening of painting for plastic surgery people in training. You see, I have a paintbrush in my hand. <laughs> and so, uh, two th March of 2014. Next. So, this, um, these are a couple of talks that I put together in the past on various occasions. But um, you see the title there, The Human Face in Art, Plastic Surgery and Beyond. Next. And the human face has been the focus of my career. I've had a lifelong interest in art, as well as clearly in surgery, and ultimately the interrelationships between art and my field of plastic surgery, and how to make each facial surgical procedure as, quote, artistic as well as functional as possible. Next. And the human face as perceived by another person, by a surgeon, 
And uh, is plastic surgery a form of art or a craft? You see down at the bottom, the Oxford American Dictionary defines art as the production of something beautiful, skill, or ability in such work. And a craft is an occupation in which skill is needed. So what is plastic surgery and what is art? When a plastic surgeon or an artist looks at a person, what does he or she say? How is the desired outcome of surgery or painting achieved? Next. And how do we think about the human face? Way perceptions are about identification, whether that person is approachable, honest, deceptive, interesting, deformed, normal, attractive, beautiful, glamorous. And the clinical perception by a surgeon is a youthful or aging face, a feminine or masculine face, a normal or ideal normal face, and individual features can be any of those. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is about mostly the, the female face and the Caucasian face, uh, and it's certainly changing in, uh, the emphasis on the Caucasian face. What Nelson said many times is, it's just interesting. I don't think of it in any of those ways. Next. So what's a youthful face or an aging face? Down at the bottom you see this Afghan girl that was on the cover of National Geographic. In her youth and the tilt of the alpha fissure up, slightly up laterally, the uh, eye striking the bottom edge of the cornea, the nose slightly up tilted, the mouth slight up tilt, and just the opposite in all those 17 years later. She was a teenager, so that's mid-30s. Uh, mid Life is hard in Afghanistan. And up, up at the top, you see the soft tissue changes. The bones change too, but they don't change very much. In fact, I hope, have a whole study down how the bones age and how they compact a little bit, mostly around the jaws, because the impact of chewing makes the jaws and the middle portion of the face get a little tighter, a little more together. So by age 40, a little laxity, and the jaws are getting a little more relaxed, so that the soft tissue rate by age 80 is approaching that. Next. These are all important to, to a plastic surgeon, and a lot of it has to do with reversing some of it. So the changing concept of facial ideals or is it changing? It is really mostly about decor, adornment, style. And beauty, a uni universally recognized concept, but what is what it is is elusive and complex. So today, actually, since I haven't uh, updated to some of the uh, things today, but its focus is on female Caucasian ideals. Next. So through the ages, the female face has been an ideal and has set the standards. Nefertiti in 1350, before the Common Era in Egypt. And you'll see the similarity of what were considered the outstanding examples. The three bony ridges of the face, the superorbital ridge, the mid-face ridge, or zygomatic ridge, and the lower jaw ridge. And in between those ridges are highlight are low light areas. The ridges are highlight areas, and then we have low light areas in the orbit and the subzygomatic area. And it, this is consistent through all, including today, through, throughout ages, all the ages in history. This is the Grecian ideal, and you see all those things in ancient Greeks. Believed outer beauty reflected grace, morality, and strength of mind. And beauty is a universally recognized concept, but definition of beauty is complex. And it differs across time and cultures. Or does it? I'm not sure it does, really. So Egypt, uh, Greece, and Rome, next. 
And uh, in Italy, we have the Botticelli and the Da Vinci, and you see those same, those same things that are by people considered ideals at that time. And then in France, uh, a little less uh, of that definition, a little more fleshy face, and not quite as strong right here. There's a little bit of breaking out of that that uh, definition I was just showing you. Next. And in the Western world, uh, those definitions I just described, the three ridges and and the uh, low light areas, the high light, low light areas. And you see them in Greta Garbo, Catherine Deneuve, and much more recently, Wall Street Journal Magazine. She was cited as a, a great beauty with the same sort of same sort of uh, things. Next. And interesting is what Nelson always said. I don't go by any standards. It's searching the soul, looking for the soul, the essence of the being, and interesting. So you see uh, Pope John Paul, Reagan, Big Bill, and Diana. And then she has an interesting face. No standards in terms of a plastic surgeon looking at the face. Next. And uh, Cicero, the uh, great Roman thinker, everything is in the face. Nowhere. And then uh, Naini is the person I know and has written a book on facial aesthetics. Says, nowhere in medicine is the fusion of art and science more important than in the clinical assessment of the human face, art and science. Next. And this is someone uh, that I think is believable, Leonardo da Vinci, in this book written by Walter Isaacson in, 10, in 2017. And da Vinci said, or Isaacson says that da Vinci said, he, he knew that art was a science and that science was an art whether drawing a fetus in the womb or the squirrels of a deluge, he blurred the distinction between the two. Next. A plastic surgeon's perspective of the face as architecture is the face as architecture and also as, quotes, art. And the surgeon looks at the whole, but then basically has to deal with the details, whether it's changing a nose or changing ears, that's the structure of ears, etc. And there are cultural and temporal changes throughout that. The goal as a surgeon is to make uh, somebody with a de defect or a deformity in the range of normal or even to ideal normal, if possible. And there is some university, universality about that. And we are never, or at least I'm basically never, on a few occasions I've had a patient tell me I want to be beautiful. And I say, well, <laughs> that's an elusive idea. And uh, it's, uh, I'm basically never, I'm trying to create something that's better or is ideal normal. Next. And aesthetics of what I look at, what we deal with, and how to change that. The uh, long, narrow face, the more formless face, that there's not a lot of low light areas, the high light areas don't stand out. And we can, I, we can create those in plastic surgery. We can remove some fat, uh, can uh, enhance the bone structure. Individual disproportions like this chin that sits, tilts backward. Next. And how do we get there? There are classic ideals, and uh, Catherine Deneuve, this is a Grecian statue that looks very much like the bone structure of Catherine Deneuve, uh, who not everybody knows these days, but she was the great beauty of the 70s and 80s. And uh, what we look at in trying to construct a face or reconstruct a face is upper, middle, lower, third, and uh, that's a, a vertical line and then a horizontal line through the inner and outer cantha. Then in profile, this line from the spirit tragal knot, 
that's the spirit trail and ashram through the lower lid is a guiding point for the three major points on the face. If you're doing something in surgery to construct it, this is the ideal to have, have a, uh, a vertical line that, cr that crosses this one at a 90 degree angle. And it's the deepest point where the nose joins the forehead. It strikes the lower lip with the upper lip sticking slightly beyond it and strikes the chin. Next. And then these come into play when examining patient's face to do changes in it. Uh, FTFT, the bitemporal distance from this ridge right here across is all of these should line up ideally. Um, and uh, the, the five malar, or the most prominent part of the cheekbone, is and the gonial angle out here. So that should be ideally uh, a straight line. The widest point of the face should be the zygomatic arch that's out here. And uh, these are just the symbols used for that. Next. And these are all important. If I'm doing surgery and I want to know if I'm going to move the whole bone structure forward or backward, I need to know the basic, uh, where the ideal is. And so the ideal on how the eye fits into the orbit is that the pupil should be 8 to 10 millimeters or, or this point through the nose, the base of the nose right here should be 8 to 10 millimeters in front of the pupil. And this, the lateral orbital rim, should be 10 to 16 millimeters behind the pupil. Then the upper and lower jaw, the upper jaw should sit slightly in front of the lower jaw. Your teeth should sit slightly in front. And with those two foundations, you can, a surgeon can Reconstruct the entire facial structure, uh, the entire facial structure of the patient. Next. And shading is extremely important. Uh, you're looking for the, the highlight, low light areas, definition, angularity. This is uh, drawing the human head by the person who wrote a book on, a, a, about art. And uh, I've, as I mentioned to you, there's the, the three ridges that are the highlight areas and then the low light areas, two of those. So it's very interesting, back when I put this together for the first time, probably 15 or 20 years ago, uh, Cindy Crawford was a very famous model at that time. And we had a person working, a nurse working in the office. And I noted that the only thing Julie who was making probably 40,000 here and Cindy Crawford probably making a million here, <laughs> The only difference in their apparent, look at this, the arc of the eyebrows are essentially identical. The very narrow opening of the eye tilting up is basically identical. The definition of the nose is basically identical. The small upper lip, the lower lip. The only difference when you look at these is the fullness of the face. And here having the accentuated uh, three ridges of the face, high light, low light, and you see down at the bottom, it's illustrated. Next. And here's a patient that uh, I reduced some of the fat in her face, augmented some of the, uh, augmented her middle or mid face or cheekbones, and uh, reduced her nose a little bit for more definition. And uh, normal and normal plus. Next. Can I ask you, what does normal plus mean? Pardon me? What does normal plus defined as, please? Sorry. Well, I'm sorry. What is normal plus defined as, if I may? Uh, it's a very difficult definition, but it's more what the patient wants and more toward those things I showed you earlier, well-defined three ridges and the highlight and low light. Uh, that she doesn't have the definition here. It's very full. So the ideal normal when patient, patients come to see me, it's uh, to try to find out what they want. 
and they will say, I want a smaller nose, or I want cheekbones, or I don't like all this puffiness in my face. So the idea of normal is based on all those things I showed earlier. The uh, ideal profile, the ideal middle thirds, and this, this approaches that. It's, it's a very elusive thing. And the ideal for one person may not be the ideal for another. But we have to have some goal when you're doing surgery. Next. So the video. What time is it there? I had to turn my phone off. 5.30. This was a video I'm going to show you next. Some slides about the center of human appearance. This is an introduction to the center of human appearance. Most of our communication is not verbal. And through these nonverbal signals, we draw conclusions about the people around us. In an effort to be better understood, we can try to improve our clothing, our makeup, and our posture. And consequently, we're able to project a more positive image to those around us. Unfortunately, there are many individuals in our society who face challenges with their appearance, which exceed the norm. For many of them, making simple cosmetic changes will never achieve their ultimate goal, which is to be accepted and understood by others. In 1987, Dr. Linton Whitaker, a surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania, recognized the need to better treat individuals in ways that had not been done before. Through the visionary planning of Dr. Whitaker, the Center for Human Appearance became a reality. There is no other organization in the world that brings these two disciplines together, the medical and the psychological sciences, in a comprehensive manner to help people across the lifespan with problems related to their appearance. The mission of the CHA is research and education with a goal toward improving the understanding and treatment of all problems of appearance. In 1987, the CHA was formally established with six specialties having a dominant interest in appearance all working together. Those specialties are plastic surgery, ophthalmology, dermatology, oral and maxillofacial surgery, neuropsychology, and otolaryngology. These represent the medical, surgical, and neuropsychological specialties that have a major focus on problems of appearance. We became funded by the Edwin and Fanny Gray Hall Trust in 1994, and this has allowed us to be even more cohesive, allowing the Center for Human Appearance to prosper. The mission of the CHA is really to break down barriers between historically disparate groups, the surgical specialties, psychology, uh, dermatology normally don't talk to each other except maybe when they have a, a patient problem. This group allows us to interact to really address questions creatively, especially around human appearance. It's a very special group of individuals and I think over the years has really done a tremendous job of creating an environment that allows us to, to move forward in a very unique way. The reason this is important to have this kind of collaboration among specialties is that patients don't get sick according to academic departments. They don't get sick according to the Department of Plastic Surgery, the Department of ENT. If you're in a car accident, you may need expertise from plastic surgery, oral and facial surgery, ENT, and that's exactly what we've accomplished with the collaboration in the Center for Human Appearance. My sense is that the collaboration in the Center for Human Appearance has affected how the health system also looks at healthcare. So we now have service lines. If you have lung cancer, you come to our lung center and you see a pulmonologist, a radiologist, and a surgeon on the same day. You don't go to three different departments. And I think it was the Center for Human Appearance that set that standard of collaborative interdisciplinary care. <clears throat> The educational activities that the CHA provides uh, are really innumerable. We have a monthly conference uh, where our residents interact with residents from ENT, from dermatology, from oral maxillofacial surgery. Again, residents that they would not ordinarily interact with. They'll see how well all of the senior faculty from the competing specialties work well together and that we really do try to solve problems collectively and hopefully that's something that they'll carry forward for their entire careers. It's something that's very special here. 
I think that my experience with the Center for Human Appearance has significantly impacted my training here at the University of Pennsylvania, but I foresee that it will impact the way that I treat and address patients moving forward in my career. Resident learning is realizing how much you don't know. And the one thing that the Center for Human Appearance has allowed me to think more about is surgery just hits the tip of the iceberg. It addresses one component of a problem, but there are multiple different parts to that problem that don't really come into play until you start talking to other members of a multidisciplinary team. One very important function of the CHA is to provide seed funding to get exciting research started and when young people see that a finding in a lab can impact the lives of a patient, that really resonates with them and it pushes them towards a career in research. I think it kindles a real fire in medical students and graduate students because they realize that what they're doing in a lab can impact a patient. One of the things that the Center for Human Appearance has provided is funding for a pair of VAs on. What the pair of VAs on does is connect families. It's very daunting for a new family who comes in with a child who has a facial difference to, to know what they're facing. And our VAs on connects them with other similar families who have had this experience so that they can understand how things are going to unfold, how things will happen, what they may face, and have a sympathetic ear to listen to their concerns and share their experiences. <laughs> One of our goals is to reach an international audience, and we're able to accomplish this through lectures and publications. I believe that there are many exciting horizons to be crossed in terms of genetics and immunologic therapy. <laughs> and that I believe will be very exciting and very productive in the future. The CHA is expanding the understanding, the impact of, and care for those with problems of appearance. One way we do that is to engage with several medical and non-medical fields and endeavor in something I call the untraditional. We work with several leading organizations to better understand and deal with the impact of appearance in a broader spectrum of life. Through these partnerships, we're able to study and document the effect of appearance on everyday life, business, communication, relationships of all types, and the impact of appearance on the human brain itself. An example is the Penn Veterinary Stroke. The CHA hosts an event for children with problems of appearance, offering interaction with animals, and also have gone through a corrective facial surgery. The therapeutic effect for these children is both giving and receiving unconditional love is an essential part of the healing process. Another example is the face-to-face -face portrait project with Studio Kavanati, a famous realist art school here in Philadelphia. This project brings children with craniofacial problems together with the artists, focusing on their spirit and their soul rather than their appearance, helping these children to see themselves in a different way. Our goal with medical and or surgical treatment is not to change someone to be physically perfect. A change from major problems of facial appearance or even more limited features of concern to normal or ideal normal where possible is the goal. Such changes can have a major impact on a person's life. Looking forward, my goal for the Center for Human Appearance is that it continue to play an international and leading role in expanding both the understanding of the impact of appearance on all of us and the pursuit of the most advanced treatments. In this way, we attempt to minimize issues related to appearance, allowing for greater confidence and potential to interact better in the world, thus helping to improve the lives of patients with appearance-related problems. So if we can above, go back to the slides, then that uh, video was put together about a year ago now. So um, these are the three institutions 
Well, considering human appearance is not an institution. Well, in, as, in a way it is, but it's not a geographic. It's more more a concept and a non-geographically tethered place. Uh, next, appearance of dominant factor in life. And the ancient Greeks used the phrase koloskai agathos to refer to beauty of the body and of the spirit. They believed a person's outer beauty reflected his or her grace, moral fortitude, and strength of mind. Beauty is shorthand for ideal normal. The word beauty is not a good word. This is a little editorial. Uh, it's not a good word in general because it implies something in a human being that, boy, what a beauty. It may not, I mean, the ideal normal is in surgery what we're looking for mostly. And um, it's uh, what we're looking for in surgery normally is a scale of one to 10. We're looking for something in about the six or seven to eight, certainly not the nine or 10 and certainly not four and backward. Next. Appearance historically in surgery has been an issue for a very long time, and it's the first printed and known problems that it was trying to solve was 600 before the Common Era in India, where the first, quotes, plastic surgeon uh, did nose restrictions, as did happen in Italy, Sicily, and in Bologna, uh, because amputation of the nose was a form of punishment at that time. And there were a lot of amputated nose faces, faces with amputated nose. This person, Tagli Ecosi in Bologna, became sort of the symbol of reconstructive plastic surgery worldwide. And it's, uh, this is from the book that Tagli Ecosi wrote, and that's an arm bringing some skin up uh, with the arm uh, in that cast and bringing up to the nose where a nose has been amputated. That's a universal symbol for, uh, symbol for uh, plastic surgery in all the world. And uh, then came on up to the 1700s where it really started more. There was some issue about, this is cosmetic too, but it's cosmetic reconstructive, all that. This is a little more of today's idea about uh, cosmetic, uh, still more reconstructing, trying to take it back to what it was, cosmetic being trying to make it better than it was. Next. And uh, as so many things, uh, plastic surgery, that so many things that began in this city, uh, it really began on this side of the Atlantic uh, and from India, the Pacific, I guess. John Metauer regarded as America's first plastic surgeon, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and is, is credited with performing the first operation for cliff, lip, and colic in the Western Hemisphere in 1821. And the beginnings of plastic surgery, there's so much of it in, related to Philadelphia. Uh, I can't, can't do all that discussion, and probably it's not as much interest, but really the beginnings of the Board of Plastic Surgery and uh, much that's, uh, that's, that's done now were started by Robert Ivey, who was here, born in, born in Philadelphia, and was educated at Penn, and became a dominant factor in plastic surgery starting in, in uh, the early 1920s. Next. And uh, this medical school, the nation's first, and uh, they, this book, very large book, was put together uh, at its 250th anniversary in 2015. And there was not a lot about plastic surgery in there, but Dr. Ivy, who I just mentioned, started a type of program that became more or less universal, bringing all those specialties together in one setting to start working on patients that had, had clips of the lip and palate because you need multiple specialties working together. And uh, I patterned a craniofacial program bringing multiple specialties together 
to do surgery for major facial and head defects in 1972, and then uh, the Center for Human Appearance, which is described over there as uh, the reason it made its way into this book as a significant thing that happened next. And uh, it, it really started, uh, as you heard in, in this video, in 1988, and we got substantial funding uh, from the whole, uh, from the whole estate. And you've heard about the six specialties and beyond traditional. Next. And the objectives of the CHA, when I was trying to get money for it, I had to have give some reason. And uh, that became very successful. But basically, it's to advance the treatment book and promote awareness and understanding of the importance of appearance. There's so much coming out now. The New York Times just had a big article on that. Anyway, to, it's uh, to emphasize the importance to medical professionals and to the public through education and research in all aspects of appearance. Next. And these are, you heard in, this, in the uh, video, these are the six specialties that interact with uh, all and uh, beyond the medical specialties, we have regular presentations how it affects uh, business, for example, or acting, or people with the vet school, or studio and commonality. Next. And you just saw this. This is the face-to-face -face program, which uh, we have thought has been a very uh, terrific program. Thanks. And here's another example. She's at the Annenberg School of Communication and she's written several books on appearance and, and its impact uh, on people, the appearance of people. Next. And just as of uh, this year, uh, Anjan Chatterjee has become the director of Neuro Neuroaesthetic Center in Penn, and we have very close relations. And uh, this is part of the beyond traditional, not traditional medical specialties. And uh, so he attempts to understand the factors that shape how we pursue beauty and aesthetics. And my comment is. Human beings are constantly seeking beauty that represents harmony, achievement, health, and beautiful as in a beautiful speech, beautiful building, beautiful automobile, beautiful surgical procedure, etc. Next. And three or four slides on how appearance affects everything we do, other than a death uh, approaching operation are, uh, are something that uh, that you could say is very important. In a sense, there's nothing more important than that appearance. And this shows what happens in the brain. And then John Chatterjee is doing really groundbreaking breaking work to demonstrate what's happening in your brain by an MRI scan when you look at something. And these two brains show the response to, to facial appearance and place of building uh, appearance. And there's basically, and without getting into detail, these are facial appearance and a building appearance or any other object. And they, we react in our brain, basically identical to those two. Next. And here's another example. Uh, what's going on again, an MRI scan, and uh, there's an auto automatic response to beauty. Uh, even when making judgments about identity, who somebody is, and this is the identity, just think about who is that. And the beauty, the beauty, uh, sorry, I had a head injury. The beauty uh, way our MRI shows up, and basically, the identity and beauty judgments are about this, 
about the same. Is there a greater response to attractive versus non-attractive faces? Next. And another example, and there are now many of these, but gee, these are just three or four that have been published in legitimate journal. And uh, the brain responds automatically to attractiveness, and you cannot avoid it. And there's more, more studies now showing that it shows no significant difference in response to both face and place, face and building, or face and landscapes. There's no significant difference. It shows up the same in the brain for this MRI. Next. And I think this is the, the final of the uh, automatic, yeah, automatic uh, response to beauty, even when, when making judgments about identity. There are greater responses to attractive versus non-attractive faces. And this is the beauty judgment responding there and the identity judgment. Next. And the good, the beauty is good stereotypes assumes that attractive people possess socially desirable personalities and higher moral standards. This is the way it is. And maybe we'll learn to make some other judgment. The study shows neural mechanisms for judging those qualities overlap. For example, an abandoned dog and a, uh, a person that's an attractive person. This is the scale that shows those two things. This is the goodness rating. Person who is attractive is uh, rated high. This is the end point. And the, the, uh, the dog rating is basically the same rescue of an abandoned dog. Next, Dean Hammermesh. Dan Hammermesh uh, at the University of Texas in a, an economic review showed that earnings, the quotes good looking, earns more than the average McLean. The beauty premium is a plus 5%, plus 5% over that, plus 5% over that. And the plainest plainness penalty is a negative 5 to 10%. The effect is equally important in men and women. Wendy Steiner at Penn, who's part of our uh, other uh, other aspects of appearance, reality impact of appearance, the real thing, the reality impact of appearance. Nancy Etcoff at Harvard, psychologist, the great, great beauty premium is in our biology. Next. And a Princeton psychologist, Andrew Todorov, in the New Yorker magazine looked at hundreds of congressional races, predicted winners with 77% accuracy on the basis of their appearance, not by any other basis. Voters perceive baby faceness, broad cheeks, small chin, big eyes, as signs of incompetence. And facial maturity, strength, a jutting chin, for a brown, angular nose, connotes capability. Next. And this book, Richard Prom, uh, The Evolution of Beauty, said uh, that the most beautiful creatures attract more mates as a result. The most attractive features spread in future generations. Charles Darwin, who I suspect everybody knows was, wrote the uh, definitive book on the origin of species. At least he thought so. He thought that uh, that appearance had nothing to do with it. But 12 years later, he had changed his mind as a son of man selection in relation to sex. Darwin began to treat sexual selection based on appearance as something distinct and equally powerful. So survival of the fittest might not be enough to explain nature. We might need survival of the prettiest too. Next. And uh, the New York Times recently, um, January 9, 2019, had this cover article on how beauty is making scientists rethink evolution. Actually, this has been out there now for at least a decade. Uh, but the splendor of the, in the animal kingdom um, 
is something the more attractive, more demonstrative in the animal kingdom are selectively, they, they uh, have more mates. They uh, just get more of the good things in their life. Next. So, the plastic surgeon's perspective on the problem spectrum of the human face, uh, these are the four basic things we treat. Birth defects, post-trauma defects, post-tumor, where big portions of the face may be taken out, and the purely cosmetic end of the spectrum. This represents about 40% of what we do, and this, the top three, about uh, 60%. Next. And the, the goal possibility on a scale of 1 to 10, this is a major deformity, a person that, a picture or a person that's in the 1 to 3 range. Normal is uh, 4 to 6 on this scale, and the ideal normal is in the middle of that, around 7 to 8, and the beauty, beauty glamour. Uh, there are a few clinical examples I want to show you about this. Next. This was one of the first things that I did, one of the things that uh, helped make whatever reputation I had. Uh, this is not something that's harmful to a person, but uh, it's where one of the future sutures, the soft spots in the skull, uh, fuses too early, and it does not affect anything except your appearance. But uh, uh, mothers and fathers don't like the difference, and uh, I started a way of moving the bone that's pushed back forward and uh, rearranging the upper part of the face next. And here's an example of that. This bone on this side is pushed back because the suture's holding it back. It pulls the eye open. That child could live with that. But on that scale of uh, 1 to 10, we took this child from what is probably a two or a three up to a five in the normal range. Next. And some examples of aesthetic changes on facial talk right here. Uh, trying to achieve from normal to better than normal. Uh, this becomes aesthetic surgery. Uh, and it's the convergence of aesthetic and reconstructive surgery in the face, or I've called it interface surgery. Next. And uh, this is application of reconstructive surgery to cosmetic surgery. And uh, this is one of the earlier patients I did, February 1982, published in our most dominant journal. And uh, you see her chin has been moved, her cheekbones augmented, and uh, I think I also did a facelift. What you see in profile of the chins, the bone has changed. The bone here has changed. There was not much of that going on at that time in 1982. Next. So now the more reconstructive end of the spectrum, um, that uh, and the in the middle part, trying to achieve this sort of six to eight or seven to eight, be in that, not at the either end of the spectrum. Next. And here's a patient who had trauma and, actually, and had been operated on, actually, in England. Uh, and uh, you see the changes. She had a, a defect in her bone. She had defects in the bone of the nose. And uh, I think her palpitation of the eyes are a little different, not much. But what I did was bone grafts to fill in where the bone was destroyed and bone grafts along here. And I think I did a, a bit of a facelift. But the thing, the thing that's uh, most important about her is taking her from probably a three to a six on this, on this uh, scale that I tried to quantitate appearance, which you can't do, but I tried. Next. And here's a totally reconstructive patient um, that is born with all the sutures of the head, the soft spots of the head closed, creating this deformity of bulging eyes and forehead you'll see in profile uh, that's back 
you see after surgery in this patient went from about a 2 to a 5. Next. And you see that the eye socket is too small for the eye, so it bulges out. This should sit. That's where these numbers come in. This should sit uh, about 10 millimeters back, a uh, third of an inch. And uh, this bone should come out to be about 13 millimeters in front. And you see what was done moving this structure from there to there, from there to there. Next. And another example, a patient who had a downward tilt of the eyes, this is, I moved her entire forehead forward, uh, tilted the eyes up, added some bone here, and uh, did move her chin forward. And this, I would say, arbitrarily, went from a three to a six, because this is all normal now. This is not quite all normal, and you'll see more in the profile. profile. Uh, next, please. And you can see, again, the eye is too far out of the eye socket, so you need to expand the eye socket. And you see the eye sits more comfortably back in the socket, and her chin was moved forward. And her, her middle ridge was augmented. Next. And the purely cosmetic end of the spectrum, uh, towards the ideal normal, we started from here, a normal structure, to take it out to there toward the ideal normal. Next. And here's an Asian girl who uh, I would say this is uh, not so rare in Asian cultures, but here in the United States, it looks a little unusual, still normal and starting from probably a four out to a six, and you see the reduction here and the lengthening of her chin here. Uh, it's a very short chin. Next. And a patient, another example, this patient, this is purely cosmetic, felt she was too narrow here, and the chin was a little too long, and the eyes took, at any rate, I augmented the posterior part of her jaws, uh, lengthened the chin slightly, sorry, reduced it slightly. And she went from probably a five to a six, and it's what she thinks that's the important thing. Next. And uh, I think there's one more after this, but this is a patient who came to see me because he didn't like this width here, he didn't like the, her, his chin. And what I did was to take away some of the bone back here and, uh, and lengthen his chin. Next. And you see the chin is lengthened and uh, this angle of this jaw shaved off some of that bone so this uh, more like the usual one. He probably went from a five to a seven. Next. And the final patient, the only thing I did that uh, is the bony structure is to lengthen her chin. I also, uh, I did a facelift on her, but uh, she, she probably went, based on the facelift as well as the chin change, went from a, uh, nearly a five to whatever you want there, nine or so. Next. And you see most of the change in the chin, where the bone structure was changed, and the skin envelope was changed. Next. So, a few competent thinkers. Beauty is a far greater recommendation than any letter of introduction, Aristotle said. And Tolstoy in Russian said, it is amazing how complete the delusion is that beauty is goodness. Next. The end. <laughs>
So I came out and lectured at Penn, which was a real honor, and uh, I learned a lot, and some things stayed with me, and I've thought about them for, since January. And one of those is body dysmorphic disorder. And is that one of the reasons why you don't go for the high end of the scale on beauty, is because it's hard to define what beauty is, or somebody's sense of self? Well, you know, tell me what beauty is. I, don't, I mean, I try to make every person look. I go for the high end every time, but it's just not. So, sometimes it's not possible and not advisable. Like if a person starts saying, "My nose after your surgery is a little bit too big still, but it's a normal nose now," and uh, you know, pick, people get very picky about cosmetic surgery. And uh, I try to, one of the things I did when I was in active practice is to try to make their, their expectations realistic. And when you start trying to achieve a 10 on a 10, it's not possible at first. There's always a fault. And uh, so you have to get that into the patient's head. There is no perfect face. What is a perfect face? And I tried to try to take it to as close to the 10 as possible, but I, I tell every patient there's no such thing as perfect, perfect, you're going to have flaws, because it's just like an exist. I can show you who are the famous beauties through history, Elizabeth Taylor, you know, on and on, I can show you the flaws. That's what a plastic surgeon has to, has to do, has to, has to do. Okay. Has, um, has, has the field changed a lot in the last 50 years, and do you think it's getting better, or do you think that do you see sometimes cosmetic changes that that make you think, oh my God? Well, there's, <laughs> there's a there's a tendency for some so-called plastic surgeon, and this field plastic surgeon that everybody wants to make if you get cash in advance. By the way, you have to go through insurance companies. And they don't pay as well as they used to. So, I mean, there now. When I started and up to the near the end of the point of my operating career nine years ago, uh, from about the last 15 years, all of those other specialties that are now the six that I put up there, or at least five of the six, they want this. They want to do this. When I started in the first 30 years, uh, nobody else but a board certified plastic surgeon was doing purely cosmetic surgery. Although ENT people were doing some kind of but basically all the rest of it, what we do on the face, they went out. So, now, what are you asking? Just your reaction to contemporary plastic surgery. Like, uh, give you an example, my wife is Iranian, right? And they're, they're the, the world capital of rhinoplasty. And sometimes they really overdo it. And oh, I just wonder if you're looking at it being overdone these days, because it seems. I don't know that it's overdone now. Well, it probably is. You know, I'm a, a little bit out of that. I used to see patients, and I would see patient come, patients come in with an overdose, done nose. And there's a lot of overdone. Face looks too tight, so you look like you have a mess. Eyelid is too much taken out, so you have the eye pulled down. Too much white of the eye uh, showing. Noses were famous for being overdone, and probably still are. I just don't keep up with that anymore. Uh, it's very easy to overdo a nose. The cartilage down here, if you take out a little bit too much, the nostrils are going to collapse. Yes? Hi. Um, I'm actually a surgeon, and I was wondering if the doctors um, try to work with the patients ahead of surgery maybe on a computer to give like a simulated look if they do this and that like the patient asked for the jaw to be taken out and you know that they have to you have to move the bone up here in the zygomatic um do they work on the computer and say this is kind of roughly where you're going or is it just a verbal discussion how do you go oh, you know until uh, you know i started doing plastic surgery 50 years ago 1969 <laughs> And back then we didn't have computers. Right. And you know, that's the last, what, 15 years? And a lot of that is done. In fact, we have one of my partners at Penn was one of the early people to use that. I never used it much because I did occasionally. I would get him to do it. 
But uh, we also had a big sign up there that says this stuff um, does not imply a guarantee you're going to look like that. Right. That's a big mm -hmm. issue in cosmetic surgery. That was what I was worried about. The expectations, you know, one of the most important things as, as a surgeon uh, is to really talk about what is your expectation. Mm -hmm. And it's almost surely, in fact, it is certain it's not going to look exactly what that screen looks like. You have too many things going on. The soft tissue, if you're, let's say you're taking one up, if you take out one or two millimeters of cartilage, it's going to shrink up uh, more than you should. It's going to shrink a little bit. If you take away a little more bone than you should when you're in there, it's going to look more of a scalp. So prior to computers, how, how would you get an idea of what they want? Would you show them um, examples of different noses or different facial structures? How, how would you guys... How would you get a client on the same page with where you thought, you know, they wanted to? It's very to difficult because, again, expectations, and even if you, before computers, I would describe them to them as best I could, but I would not sketch something out. I would say they had to trust me. What's that? It's a big trust that they give you. A lot of trust. Yeah, a lot of trust. A lot of trust, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There has to be a lot of trust. And I basically just describe it. And when patients would uh, ask me to uh, sketch it for them, I'd say, the sketch is not going to be realistic. It just doesn't turn out that way. And computers really aren't much better. 